Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Allison Park Leadership Podcast. I'm one of your hosts. My name is Dave. And my name is Jeff. Of course, I'm the lead pastor at Allison Park Church. Dave's my son and the campus pastor at the north side. And our podcast, we talk about the principles behind the plans. And we are so honored to have with us special guest, Pastor Brad Leach. Give it up for everybody. (laughs) Right. Okay. So Brad is the pastor at City Life Church in South Philadelphia. And maybe, Brad, just give us a quick little bio. Who are you, your family, all that good stuff? I'm uh, married to Leah. We just celebrated our 15 year wow. wedding anniversary. That's awesome. Last week, Pastor Jeff introduced us. Come on. Yeah. So, um, so that would be what, 17, 18 years ago now? No, 16. 16. Okay. Yeah. It was we a were, quick love affair into marriage. Yeah, we, we, we met and were married 11 months later. <laughs> anyway, same time. But we have been in Philadelphia 12 years. Our church is 11 years old, and we have four wow. amazing kids. Mm-hmm. Abby, who's 13, Claire is 11. Uh, my son Caleb just turned 10, and our youngest daughter, Karis, is 7. That's, That's crazy. Beautiful, beautiful family. So tell, give us a little glimpse of City Life is an amazing congregation that you planted there. What What's special about City Life? Uh, I think that um, our church is multi-generational. It's multi-ethnic and genuinely um, in love with God and what he's doing in the city. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think you encourage church planners. And I think as a church planner, when you start a church, the dream is like, man, I would have a church that I would actually attend if I wasn't the pastor. (laughs) (laughs) And I don't know, you know, in all of my 20 years of pastoring, if I'd be able to say that, but. I can say that we have a church that just loves God, loves people, proves it. That's our simple yeah. discipleship motto, and I think focuses on the major things, and we love being a part of it. Yeah, so before we get into our topic today, which is the question, is Christianity good? I actually heard you preach uh, a series recently, and uh, it was based on a book called Jesus Skeptic, so we're going to get to that in just a minute. Um, but I'll just say I was over there last year, I think it was for your 10 year celebration. And I was sitting on the front row and just hearing the stories of what God's done there in Philadelphia through city life. And I just couldn't stop smiling. Like it was one of the happiest (laughs) moments. I was just sitting there thinking, this is the coolest thing ever. And, uh, one of the great things, cause you know, we were, we've been a part of your story since the beginning and you were homeless, basically moving from school to school to banquet hall you got to tell the miracle of the building. Come on. Cause some, there's some pastors that are listening to this and you're like, will I ever find a home? So tell us what God did there in, in city life. We were meeting in high schools primarily for about seven years and saving as much money as we could. And, you know, God had helped us save a decent amount. But when you compare that to the kind of building you need, the house, yeah, the vision in the that's city. in your heart, it just feels like pennies. Mm-hmm. And so we were staring at that gap between our resources and our vision Mm -hmm. and waiting on the Lord in frustration a lot of days. But God ultimately led us into a beautiful relationship Mm -hmm. with a pastor in the city named George Valco, who led Calvary Temple, um, a church that was 80 years old and in a building that was 60 years old. And out of that relationship, um, came an opportunity to bring our churches together. And so we, um, were given that building. We bought it technically for a dollar. Wow. And, um, and we're able to move in about four years ago and over the last few years, renovate that yeah. building. Just so a the few building blocks is, from the stadiums. Yeah. Awesome. It's worth you know, $5 million. Dollars. Yeah, five, $6 million probably Seats is about the what, value 600 people. Seats about, yeah, 550 people. Full school, gym, everything. Yeah, and just have been able to extend it into the next generation. Come and on. so it's, it, you know, it's the product of kingdom-minded thinking and generosity. Yeah. Um, from one generation to the next. It's beautiful. And it was cool having you there, you know, because you have so much invested and Back when Allison Park Church helped to um, plant 100 churches, yep. really in less you than were, 10 years. You were number one. You were number one in yeah. that process. <laughs> and uh, and yeah. so... And to see that happen now. And then <laughs> and then just real quick, describe what happened last Friday at, in that building that God gave you. One of the things, yeah, that we just feel called to do is to, um, is to 
be a part of building a coalition of churches across the city. Mm-hmm. Um, there are events that happen in our world today that highlight just the fractured nature of our society. And, you know, we've learned that when those events happen, it's too late Mm -hmm. to build relationships. They're either there or they're not. And we want to be proactive in building those relationships so that we can demonstrate to the city that the church has figured out what the rest of our world's trying to figure out unity and um, how to build a bridge, you know, in a time with so much division. And so, it's, you know, it's a long game. It's a lot of relationship building. God has given us some wonderful friends in the relation in relationships in the city. And so this, just this past Friday, we were able to host an all night prayer meeting wow. that was packed, um, with over 30 churches from across the wow. city participating. So cool. so cool. That's great. Yeah. So different racial backgrounds, different generations all together in one place, seeking God for a move of the so Holy cool. spirit move yeah. of God. That's amazing. We're really proud to be connected with City Life Church. Now, you recently preached a message that was inspired by the book, Jesus Skeptic. Um, and by the way, if you wanna to go to a website, jesusskeptic.com, you'll find all the resources that we're gonna to refer to here today. The title of your series was? The title was Skeptics Welcome. Okay, and if you go to the citylife.com website, you can find that series. You can watch through the four parts that Brad preached. I highly recommend that. But the premise of your series was basically this question we're asking today. So you had phrased it. People used to ask the question, is Christianity true? Now they're less interested in that. Now they want to know, has Christianity been good or is it good for the world? Because there is some question about that right now due to some of the fracturing in our society. So maybe describe a little bit about what inspired that series for you. Well, you know, I think there's an there is an impulse. If something, if you hear news that's good, you there's an there's an instinct and an impulse that I want it to be true. Right. You know, if I said next year Kenny Pickett's going to break out <laughs> and prove himself <laughs> to be a franchise quarterback that can take the Steelers to many more Super Bowls, everyone in Pittsburgh would would think. I hope that's true. <laughs> Preach. Come on. Amen. I hope that's true. <laughs> now, hoping it's true doesn't mean that it's true. Right. Um, like you still have to you still have to look into something and investigate and research and ask questions, but there at least is an impulse that I hope that's true. And I think what has bothered me when we look at generations that are emerging today is that there really is not an impulse to even care if Christianity is true. Did Jesus really live? Is the resurrection a historical fact? Um, There are questions that people don't even care about. And I think it is because there's not an assumption that even in the end that it's good. And so I don't care if it's true, if I don't believe that it's good or hope that it's good. Um, and the same is true if, you know, if you heard something that, that felt like really bad news, you would hope, man, I hope that's not true. I hope that's not true. And so I think that, um, I think that it's an area that we really need to speak into, um, to really, in a sense, reclaim the legacy of, you know, you say Christianity in the world, and that is a bit of a loaded term, but mm-hmm. I think really for us to to reclaim the legacy of Jesus in the world. And for those who have genuinely followed Jesus and attempted with passion to live out his teachings, what has been their collective impact on society mm-hmm. um, over the last 2,000 years? That really is what the book is built around that John Dickerson wrote. He was an investigative journalist and didn't come from, didn't come at it from a religious background, but really from that question is what is the impact of the Christian faith? Yeah. Yeah. Because, okay. So there's a lot of aspects of Christianity, which is this very broad term that describes various denominations, various eras of history that we would admit that wasn't good. Yeah. Right. And then there's, a lot of aspects of what Christianity has done in the world that has been incredibly good, but somehow is no longer described as connected to 
the influence of Jesus and his followers. So there's always been kind of a remnant of people who were truly trying to follow Christ. And then there's been a part of Christianity that's always been stuck in some kind of religious habits, bigotries, things like that. And uh, so Christianity overall hasn't been one or the other. It's kind of been a mixed bag. What we are trying to do is separate and say, but for those who over the generations have truly tried to follow Christ, what has been the impact of that group on the world? And yeah, I think it's, I think it's, it's hard to explain. I I think it's even, it's even bigger than that. Cause I think like when we, like people think back to Christianity as being like a, uh, where we came from, like, oh yeah, like people were Christian and everybody was Christian. So sure. Christians did a lot of things, but like they were just default Christians, you know, I haven't, haven't finished the book, but I've, I've begun reading it. Fantastic. Um, just as you kind of go through the history of this, but I think, um, it really almost is eye opening to be like, wait, Christians did all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, um, uh, what, what was the author's name? John Dickerson. Mm-hmm. He has this illustration of a, of a keystone species, yeah. which I thought was really bold to say. Um, but he described this idea of like otters, uh, yeah. sea otters in California and how, like, if they're not a part of it, then, you know, wildlife, these sea urchins grow and they are very destructive. And so when you introduce it, it makes everything healthy. And he was sort of comparing Christians to that as far as in our culture. But I guess maybe do we want to talk about like w- people we know or the sort of this? Um, yeah. So I think what actually happened was the sea otters had disappeared right from the coasts of California and the, the entire envi- ecosystem, the entire ecosystem was destroyed. Right. Because all of the, all of the wildlife that was coming to Monterey Bay um, was feeding on the sea kelp mm. underwater. These giant, just really forests of sea kelp and the sea urchin were destroying the sea kelp and that was not allowing any of the life support to come to these uh yeah to the wildlife and so the sea otter were almost eliminated entirely because but the problem was that they the sea otter feed on the sea urchin and when the, sea, when the sea otter were returned back, in, reintroduced back into the ecosystem, the whole thing roared back to life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good clarity there. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I, yeah no, so kind of it's such it. a great, it's I think it's picture. really the most important picture of the book because basically what he's saying is, you know, that Jesus said we're supposed to be the salt and the light, right? So, so with, if yeah, we are Proverbs doing our 11, job. 10, when the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. Right. So, so what he talks about is, even in the last few centuries, the influence of genuine Christ followers on the world has been so huge yeah. that it's almost hard to not know it, but we don't know it anymore, right? So can you give us, give us some, like, what, what kind of things are we talking about? Hospitals, uh, medical innovation, um, you know, uh, universities, the, even the idea that everyone should be able to read mm-hmm. was a foreign concept mm-hmm. for most of history. And the value of literacy for peop- for all people of all ages really came out of um, followers of Jesus who wanted their kids to be able to read scripture for themselves and wanted to offer that education to others, mm-hmm. universities, women's rights, the eradication of slavery. Yeah. You know, which again, I think shows how complicated and nuanced this issue is because on one hand, it was people who called themselves Christians that twisted scripture to defend slavery. Right. And to expand slavery, in particular here in our country, chattel slavery. But then it was... I would, who I would call genuine followers of Jesus, who realize the solution isn't let's get rid of scripture because it's being abused. The solution is let's get scripture right Mm -hmm. and actually used the real legacy of Christ and teaching of scripture to lead the abolitionist movement that Mm -hmm. eradicated slavery in the world. And so, even when you think of great leaders like Dr. King or Frederick Douglass, um, both were Christ followers. And what they were saying about justice in the world was birthed out of a Christian worldview. And, and so that often isn't really recognized so much anymore. And, and I think there's, so let's take a little side note before we go back into some of the things, because we're, we're going to talk a little bit about 
universities and hospitals and some of the other scientists and things like that that we forget. But when you started preaching, you and I were talking, Brad, when you started preaching on this series, you hit an undercurrent, uh, just the whole topic of defending Christianity sort of brings up a whole nother topic about is Christianity good, because now we're not talking about historical facts. Now we're talking about personal interactions and experiences. And so I think you shifted your series because what you discovered was something what we would call church hurt. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I think that uh, for some, you know, the, the idea of and the reality of colonialism in our history in which I think uh, political movements and governments it would, I think, usurp Christianity and in the name of Christianity use it to try to expand power mm-hmm. into other parts of the world. Um, when we talk about then you know, Christians expanding universities and some of these other things, there, I think, is a fine line there that can really tap emotionally into some of what people have experienced in terms of the downside and the hurt that can come from Christian institutions. Mm-hmm. And we've seen a lot of that in our day, Christian, you know, institutions failing to defend um, abuse victims, failing to give voice for those who didn't have a voice, abusing power. And um, I so some of the feedback along the way, even from people in our church who are in a process of what we will call de- deconstruction mm-hmm. and deconstructing their faith of trying to reconcile, okay, you're telling me that Christianity has been good for the world, but it hasn't felt good to me. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I discovered in my research, there's a great article on the Gospel Coalition that lists the four causes of deconstruction, is that not everybody who's deconstructing their faith is doing it for the same reason. And that helped me to see that if you don't, deconstruction is more of a symptom. That's an article by Tim Keller, right? Um I don't, can't remember who wrote it. Mm. Um, I saw something from him on that very subject. But it's a symptom, not the root. And and so you have to un- you have to understand the underlying reasons that somebody's deconstructing to be able to treat, you know, the, treat it with the right remedy. But the four, if I can remember the four reasons they give in the article, one is church hurt. Okay. That there are some who are deconstructing, and for them, it isn't intellectual as much as it is emotional. Right. Is that they're, they've been wounded. They've been wounded by... Uh-huh. Met for many people very personally by a pastor that they loved, a church that their family was invested in, their own family in some cases, and some more generally by the by maybe high profile Christian leaders. Um, but then the second is bad teaching. Mm-hmm. Um, and so some perhaps who were taught that to be a genuine like to respect the Bible, you can't believe in science or all kinds of just bad theology that has been there in the church. Um, you know, for some, it is a desire to sin, you know, which I think yeah, at, right. time, <laughs> True. Like at times, like you can say like, I, you know, you might, you might kind of put more, you know, nicer labels on it. But if you could peel back to somebody's heart, like I want to do what I want to do. And if I can get out from under this belief system, it'd be easier for me to do it. And then, um, and then the last one. I can't remember right now off the top of my head what the last one was. But what I realized is that a lot of people are de- are skeptical today in dealing with doubt and they're deconstructing because of church hurt. And if you are trying to address church hurt with a big pile of apologetic books, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's it's the wrong remedy. Yeah. For the actual root issue that's there. Mm. And so I think for us, it, it helped. I tr- we really tried to make a shift in the tone of the series, even though it still was apologetics of recognizing that, you know, this needs a softer tone mm. because there are, there are people who have really have, have they really been hurt by the church? Yeah. I think I, I've noticed that, and I think you're sort of adjusting this, but a lot of like people that feel hurt by the church aren't really church people like like i i know people that have been burned and you know 
they, they either they made, they made choices, felt isolated, you know, people didn't reach out to them, whatever. Now they're like personally by a pastor or by for their friends, they feel like the church wasn't there for me. But I feel like I know of a lot of people who just have an impression of the church. And it's probably, it's almost like hurt they're caring for others. You know what I mean? Like I know this person who was hurt by this or, so I, I, I don't know that it's an interesting idea because I feel like there's wounds that aren't even personal that people are carrying in a personal sense. That actually just reminded me of the fourth, the fourth reason I think they called it street cred in the article mm -hmm. that, that there is a sense in our world today that doubt is hip and that it can give you in you know, certain environments, perhaps online or in social media or different places, some credibility and some street cred if you mm -hmm. are deconstructing. And so you can't put everybody in the same boat. It's a very personal journey, I think, for everybody who's experiencing it. But um, being willing to hear people's stories you know, is a big, yeah. big part of so, it. So let me recommend that you listen to Brad's series because you'll get you'll get the tone that he's talking about and also the content, which is really great. And also then the Jesus Skeptic book and the Jesus Skeptic website, which is going to give you great resources. But let's pivot now because what is rarely, because of the concern, we don't want to take someone who's hurt and ram down a bunch of facts that isn't going to help you uh, recover if you've been hurt. Probably we need to spend another episode on church hurt. That would be a good thing to dive into. But just for a minute to, to, to sort of separate from some of the bad teaching, like for instance, let's start with science. There's almost a, you want to go someplace else I feel first, like, I feel like before that, okay. I, I don't know that everybody will immediately relate to this, but like, could we, could we start by like the accusations that people feel about the church? Okay. Like why yeah. this would even be necessary series? Because mm -hmm. I think some people are like, what, what are you even talking about? Like, okay. So one is Christianity is anti-science, that science and Christianity are at odds with each other. That's one accusation. Yeah. I mean, um, another is that Christianity is oppressive and regressive mm -hmm. yes yep mm -hmm. is going to take us backwards that it is going to it's going to further deepen the problem of marginalization mm -hmm. you know that some people in our world and our society experience that and, and and to some extent that anybody who would claim to have truth you know would use it as a weapon um you know to wield power over someone yeah. else so yes. i think that's another accusation that makes people wonder like man is this even something that mm -hmm. would be good mm -hmm. yeah. you know, for our world. It's, I think there's it, like a level that people think it's disingenuous. Like it's a vehicle for, I mean, it sort of goes along with the oppression, but it's a vehicle for people to use as a platform to, to claim a moral authority, but it's disingenuous. It's mm -hmm. really, you know, a political party, like church is just Republicans, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or conservatives or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. But... Okay. Anything else come to mind? Because I, I feel like I hear yeah. this all the time. I mean, it's probably largely on the internet or YouTube clips that I'm yeah, hearing. Yeah, well, but. I think there's a feeling that, that uh, religious people are just uncompassionate, that they're harsh, that they're mean, which can be true, Bigoted. right? So there's a... Yeah. So this is what's so complicated. Part of the accusations come from a reason, right? So it's not like, it's not like this is not true at all. There's... Every one of these, you can find anti-science Christians. You can you can find anti-compassionate Christians. You can find people who are using religion and institution to oppress others. But then there's another side to the story where there's a whole lot of life-giving things that we just never hear about anymore that need to be brought back to the surface because they're just so incredible. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, they're just so, so let's, let's do, you, you think Great. we, let's, Perfect. Die, let's Perfect. do science. Well, yeah, I think so. Um, one of the things he highlights in the book is that the scientific revolution actually dovetailed in time with the Protestant Reformation. Yeah, so cool. And that in many ways, the scientific revolution came out of the Protestant Reformation. Which is in the 1500s. Yep. And it, so it was a spiritual awakening of people coming into relationship with God personally and back into relationship with the scripture personally that inspired um many of the leading scientists of the scientific revolution mm. revolution who actually credited in their writings yeah. over and over and over 
their scientific innovation and breakthrough to their relationship with God and their faith. Yeah. And it's the Christian worldview that believes that God's a designer and that you can discover him by studying his creation. That is Mm -hmm. the worldview that allows for science to be possible. Because if you believe that everything is more mystical and it has no rhyme or reason or everything's based on luck or superstition, then there's no reason to study the divine order that God put in place. So some of the scientists, Isaac Newton, Galileo, Copernicus, yep. I mean, you just name them. All Pascal, of, Bla- Blaise Pascal. All the famous scientists, yeah. and even into today's society, some of the people that are making the greatest discoveries in biochemistry are people that are motivated by their faith in Jesus Christ. And so in no way... Francis Collins is really on the forefront of the ge- you know, a lot of the genome project, yeah. and, you know, coding human DNA and so so science is littered with people who are followers of Jesus Christ. In fact, it's probably more the exception historically to find someone who was a prominent scientist who wasn't coming from a Christian worldview. Well, that that's really important to pause on too because I think one of the biggest accusations when we talk about is Christianity good and is it regressive, as you said, where it's pulling us backwards, is it's like, well, it doesn't believe in, you know, facts. The, yeah, that, <laughs> right. It's it's totally ignorant of reality and it does not want progress and it doesn't want us to move forward. But like the basics, the people who found out the basics of like physics, like Sir Isaac Newton, didn't just, he didn't just happen to be a Christian. I mean, he was like, the reason I'm doing this is specifically because, you know, we're trying to learn about God's creation and we want to give him glory. Like in yeah. his main work, uh, I think it's Pr- Principia, or Prin- I'm not sure you say that, Prin- Principia. That's that's where he actually has, like, it's almost like a doctrinal theology <laughs> statement about his belief in God, which is his main work about, about gravity and, and physics. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, I feel like it's just, it's eye-opening to see, like, we would not have modern science at all if it weren't for the Reformation, if it weren't yeah. for the spread of Christianity. Okay, let's talk hospitals. This is another one. So I think we all we think somehow there's always been a hospital on the corner for you to go get health care. That all through the centuries there was a hospital. But basically, medical care was for wealthy people. You have a doctor that would come to your house. You would you'd have to have the money to pay that doctor, and that doctor wouldn't necessarily have all of the skill sets. He would he would be the closest one near to you. But that changed, right? You describe some of that. Yeah, I think. If I can remember, it was a woman named Mary Mose that he talks about in the book who was responding to a devastating tornado mm-hmm. that ripped through um, her home in Rochester, Minnesota. And she basically wore down a reluctant physician <laughs> who um, also was a follower of Jesus, but of just saying, like there are a lot of people who can't afford help here who desperately need it. And they opened up a clinic that turned into John Hopkins University. Um, but purely motivated by their love for Jesus and their conviction that if Jesus was here right now, based on, you know, the trajectory of his ministry, he would be giving care and attention and providing healing to um, you know, not only those who are sick, but those who are poor and can't afford medical Mm -hmm. care and medical attention. And so that clinic turned into John Hopkins university. And if you list out, I think it's the 10 largest hospitals in our country. Um, I I can't remember right now. Nine nine out of 10, nine out of of 10 were, were founded by a Christian yeah. And the last one was founded by a Jewish man who was trained by Christians. And, in a Christian and, university. In a, yeah, in yeah. a Christian university. And, and it was and, really taken from here around the world. Right. By missionaries. And now we're talking about, this happened in the 1800s. Right. Right. So we're not talking about, so 300 years ago, no one went to a hospital. There was no hospital. There was no hospital. And so Christians invented the, the clinic that became the hospital which we now come to think of almost as a right yeah. to have health care. And that is not just in, in the United States. That's around the world. There are hospitals that c- came out of that desire for Christian compassion. Yeah. Florence Nightingale was the one who invented modern nursing, which yeah. was because of because Christian, Christian compassion Christian. ministry. Yeah. yeah. Clara Barton was Red Cross, and she, she started that because of her Christian compassion. So you mean 
you just go down the line and you think, man, that's just an enormous impact on the what if we didn't have hospitals? I mean, (laughs) just think of the impact of that. How about universities, right? So all of the, now that universities, the top ones aren't Christian, but they were founded originally by Christians, right? Mainly to train pastors. Train pastors, yeah, yeah, and and people from industry. So Oxford, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, you just name them. Some of the inscriptions that you see like, like at Harvard, it's like, this is Harvard? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? For the propagation of the gospel. <laughs> yeah. You're like, what <laughs> right on earth? <laughs> yeah. So, and, and what, that, what was the motivation, Brad? That, what, why, did that, why did they start universities? What was the desire there? Well, as you said, I think to train ministers, and, but to train people to be able to read and understand and explain the Bible. Yeah. Right. And, 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 that, and then yeah. that grew to many and other disciplines. To, and, exactly. Um, you know, the teaching, the teacher's heart and the idea that education should be available in a way that is equitable, um, you know, I think really comes out of even the kind of teacher that Jesus himself was. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus was a teacher who was willing to roll out of the synagogue and the places where um, some of the more elite educated religious folks would be and Mm -hmm. um, took uh, the truth of God mm-hmm. into leper colonies and, yeah. you know, the fringes of society. And I think it's that impulse that has motivated um, so many Christians to say, like, you know, villages and towns, like, they need a school. Yeah. People need to be able to read. Yeah, and then even social justice is something that is really birthed a lot out of the Christian. This is what I am so moved by when I, you know, read some of the writings of Dr. Martin Luther King is that he describes almost all of his vision out of the framework of Jesus ethic and how he saw the world and to see someone or like a Frederick Douglass suffering so much under the oppression that that he went through, but taking his vision for liberty out of Jesus's mindset is amazing. Or I don't know, this was in the book, but you know, like President John Quincy Adams, who after he was no longer the president of the United States, his Christianity, were, you know, birthed in him a desire to see slavery end in our country. So he became a congressman specifically so he could every day get up and propose an amendment to end and abolish slavery through the 1830s and 40s. So, I mean, like uh, these kinds of passionate people, William Wilberforce, who helped influence its end in Great Britain, all believers in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And while, like you said, there is the other side of the story, which were people that were Christians who were help holding slaves and, you know, involved in human trafficking, which is a disgrace to the name of Christ. There were, there was a, on the other side, true followers of Jesus who were trying to make that change. Um, you, you talked about that in one of the four messages, right? Yeah. Um, the second message, you know, we talked specifically the whole message about, um, racial, the fight for racial equality Yeah, throughout church history and the ending of slavery. Um, one of the stories that really inspired me from the book was about a pastor of a church in Kentucky who had become anti-slavery and began preaching against slavery to a church that was full of slave owners and plantation owners in his own church and um ended up being threatened and his life threatened and run out of his church and so he moved across the state lines from kentucky into ohio um which i believe was a was a free uh state at that point and he would basically you can see a picture of his of looking out of his house, you can still go there today through his window and a light, like a little like candle lit in the window that is people who are escaping, um, the South and trying to slaves, trying to escape coming across a river. He would run down and meet them and bring them across and be shot at. And that's, you know, Dr. King and Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, these are high profile names that we honor that because of their faith worked to end slavery, but there are so many other names of people that, um, you know, have just kind of been lost to history who risked so much 
because of their faith in Christ, to see slavery ended. Even the Quakers, you know, were really on the front lines, the front edge of, uh, you know, from before the United States was even officially founded as a nation, Mm -hmm. working to end slavery and all of their propaganda. um, The actual word campaign that we use today, political campaign or a building campaign that a church might have, it came that word campaign came out of the Quakers campaign mm. to end slavery. Wow. So Quakers and, were a religious denomination. Mm-hmm. But actually we live in the Quaker state right we here do, in yeah. Pennsylvania, which makes you feel pretty good because they were people that were uh they were against violence, number mm-hmm. one, and they were against slavery. And they were really wanting to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. That was kind of their founding. And all of the literature that fueled their campaign was full of scripture. Mm-hmm. Scripture after scripture after scripture. Um, and so again, while scripture was twisted and misused to defend slavery and expand slavery, it was the right interpretation of scripture, um, you know, proclaimed by those who are willing to risk their lives Mm -hmm. to bring it to an end. And I think like what's, what's so important to zoom in on is these people didn't just happen to be Christians. The reason that the hospitals and universities and you know, the social justice movement were started were, were because of the conviction of, if I want to follow the teachings of Jesus, this is what we have to do. So modern America that we live in today would look probably nothing like what it looks like. Mm-hmm. Maybe the whole well, Western yeah, world. Well, yeah, it wouldn't just be the, the United States. I mean, there are it, a lot of these things have impacted the entire globe. Yeah, um, People's lifespans are longer. They're twice as long. There, there, there's yeah. less poverty in the world. There's just so many initiatives that are going on right now. And, and, um, so, so I think I, you know, I, I here, a little personal reflection. When I think about cr- the word Christianity and is Christianity good? I, I guess I have to say, I want, I, I can pick and choose which part of Christianity I choose to belong to. Yeah. Like there, there always, there always has been a part of, what has been labeled Christianity that I would want nothing to do with. Mm-hmm. And, and there's then there's been another part of revolutionary Jesus followers who are willing to risk everything to, to, to follow Christ that I always would want to be a part of that. And for people to then link all of that together as if it's just one thing, mm-hmm. there, there's a false version and there's a true version. And when you catch the true version of what it is to follow Christ, there's nothing more purposeful, intentional, good, healthy, I mean, worth giving your life for than that. But the, the other stuff, I, I, I agree. I don't want anything to do with that. Right. And I think we have to be mature enough to be able to admit that this is a movement that's 2000 years old, that has a mixture and you can reject the parts of this movement that doesn't really represent Jesus. Well, and there's two, you know, there's two solutions, I guess. One is to say, let's get it right. Right. Let's be true to who Jesus was and what he taught and see the change, you know, the world change. The other is to say, let's get rid of it. And we've seen in our lifetime the fruits of that. Let's get rid of it. Let's get rid of it. And, you know, there are there. I think that there it's fair to talk about the atrocities that have been done Mm -hmm. in the name of Christianity and people who have been killed in inquisitions and crusades and slavery. Um, but to also put it in its historical context, like it's, I, I can't remember. I did the research during the series, but it's something like, I think 300,000 people or something through all the crusades and inquisitions and all of that, that were killed in the name of Christianity expanding horrible, like something that was evil that mm-hmm. should never have happened. But the reality is that if you look then at those who say, well, we need the answer is let's get God out of society. That led to the most oppressive atheistic regime regimes in world history. Yeah. And when you add up the number of lives that were lost to communist Russia and communist China and it's the Khmer Rouge and Cambodia. hundred million is what they're saying. Millions and millions and million. millions yeah. and millions and millions. Yeah. One century. And so we have seen that what we have seen the experiment of let's just take God out of it. And it isn't what it isn't what we want. Yeah. I like the analogy that John Dickerson used of the trees in his backyard. 
he, he talked about how he grew up in California, or he had a house in California where he had a lemon tree and I don't know what the other one was, like an orange or an apple tree or something. And he was saying like he didn't plant them, but every year it would have like dozens of pieces of fruit that would kind of come ripe and his kids would, you know, grab the stuff off the tree. And he was saying, we, we live in a world that has so many of the benefits and the relics of what real Christianity has given to us that for whatever reason we've sort of hidden or forgotten about. And I do think it's important, especially as Christians, to maybe take a little bit of pride in what the best part of following Jesus has actually resulted. Yeah, um, yeah because this narrative, you're never going to hear it in the popular culture anymore. I mean, it's the, the, the Christian person is never the hero in the movie. Right. There's never going to be that episode in the TV show where they say, wow, look at how that Christ follower <laughs> did. So like you're, you're, you're always going to wear the villain hat as far as the world's concerned. And for me, it was just refreshing to read the book, to just be reminded, wow, I have quite a herit a, leg a legacy that I've inherited. Yeah. 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 And, um, you know, this is something to tell your kids about, because again, this isn't really imparted anymore. Uh, with, without without becoming arrogant or or denying the fact that there are people that are walking around hurt because people have done Christianity the wrong way. Yep. Yeah. So, but I think we have to have that balance. Yep. So, if people wanted to hear the series you did, Brad, where would they go? Uh, CityLifePhilly dot com. Um, you can search City Life Philly on YouTube mm -hmm. and find the Skeptics Welcome playlist there as well. Um, maybe just to kind of frame one last thought from you know, the life of Jesus. When John the Baptist was in prison, um, you know, his entire message had been the Messiah is here. Repent. He had staked everything on this conviction that Jesus was the Messiah and he was here and he was in prison and he had the real human moment of doubt, which, you know, I think all of us, we believe and we doubt. All of us to varying <laughs> degrees, you know, doubt, not not even just in the big things does God exist, but even like I doubt that God really loves me. Mm -hmm. Like just the little doubts that we deal with day day in day out. Like He was there and He sent His disciples to ask Him, like, "Are you really the one? Did I get this all wrong? Like, did I did I totally miss this?" And I love that Jesus welcomed His doubt, didn't rebuke Him, didn't condemn Him, but He told His disciples, "Go back and tell John." How much good I'm doing. Mm. Go to go back and tell John how much good is coming out of my life. Go back and tell him that blind people who've never been able to see their children's faces, who've never seen a sunset, are being healed. Go back and tell John that lepers who have been cast out of their communities can't have physical t contact with their spouses that they're being cured. Go back and tell John that the good news is being preached to the poor. Go back and tell him how much good is happening. And in some way, that testimony is going to buffer his doubts, mm. build his faith. And That's I think, good. I think we should be welcoming to the doubts people have in our communities, our churches, within our, we should be welcoming to ourselves and the mm. doubts that we each have individually at, at different times, and then be reminded of how much good is coming out of the life and legacy of Jesus. So good. So good. Hey, well, thanks so much, Brad, for joining us today. Again, check out that series. Um, and we just want to say, hey, thank you for joining us as, as listeners. Uh, we would just so appreciate it if you would take a minute to give us a review on uh, Apple Podcasts. You can also go five-star review on Spotify, like and subscribe on YouTube, share on social media. It really helps us to spread the word, share the resource. So, hey, we hope you had a great time with this episode. We'll see you guys next time.